welcome back, everyone, to Sweet Script Stories, uh, hosted by Salto. My name is Eric Grubaugh, and I am joined today, as usual, by my amazing co-host, Tim Dietrich. Thank you so much. And... I'm not sure I'm amazing, but thank you. It's good to see you again. Everyone here is sure, though. Uh, today, we are here to talk about what it takes to be a good NetSuite developer. And I think the first thing we need to talk about is what, what does good mean? But uh, before we get into that, this episode is hosted and sponsored by Salto. And Salto is not a consulting company trying to sell you services, but they have built a powerful DevOps platform for you to manage your changes, your customizations, your scripts between your NetSuite environments. If you'd like to learn more about that, check out salto.io. All right, Tim. We are here to talk about what it takes to be a good competent maybe NetSuite developer, but I think before we start talking, we need to talk about what does good mean in this context? Mm. What is, wow. How do we even, how do we even tell? How do we measure? Um, and it's hard. It's highly subjective. It's very personal. Mm. Uh, so these are, these are definitely opinions. <laughs> these are our opinions based on experience. Um, but it's going to be subjective. It's going to change depending on what you what your yardstick is. What good means to you? I have one. If you don't have a have a definition, yeah, well, go, you go first. <laughs> yeah, to me, at least for this conversation, a good good NetSuite developer is someone that both a teammate and a client or user uh, can't wait to work with again. It's pretty straightforward. It's also very fuzzy and not very, you know, objective. But yeah, no, I think that's good. Um, I wasn't really thinking about it that way, but I like that. For me, I think it's someone who's a, has a combination of good technical skills and also what I would refer to as good soft skills. You know, I, sure. and we can talk about the details of that. So, yeah. Um, and before we get too far into the, into the discussion, everyone here, if you're listening live, you can, you should be able to ask questions. Uh, you should be able to upvote questions, try to, you know, keep them as generally relevant as possible. We can't solve your work tasks on this call. Um, and we'll try to give, if we get a bunch of questions, we'll try to give as much time to those as we can. But yeah, let's, I guess, let's get into then wherever you want to start, the the technical skills, the hard skills, I guess, yeah. the soft skills. Where would you like yeah. to start? So, you know, it's, it's funny because I was looking at the way that we've been promoting this online. And I think mm -hmm. um, it referred to, at one point it referred to us as, or whatever, as top tier developers or something along those lines. And I it's funny because I certainly don't consider myself to be a top tier NetSuite slash SuiteScript developer, not even close. I've talked about that before. Um, and I see the irony in that, right? It's like, especially when you consider the nature of this podcast in this particular episode, I just, I, you know, I'm, it's just not me. I'm not like an awesome SuiteScript developer by any means. But what I do have, I think, is a lot of development experience in general and so I tend to kind of think outside of what I would call the NetSuite box and um, so when it comes to the work that I'm doing in NetSuite I think that's really been the key to my success you know but that all being said in the work that I do I get a chance to work with a lot of other developers a lot of other NetSuite developers um, and you know, I get to work on code that other developers have written things like that so it's given me an opportunity to see I think what makes a good developer, uh, what makes a better than good developer, and then also, you know, a not so good developer. <laughs> so there's my sort of disclaimer. I am not, I, I don't know. I feel, what is, what is the phrase for when you feel like, uh, you know, you're not really qualified for something. <laughs> You feel like an imposter? Yeah, right. Like imposter, you have imposter syndrome. syndrome. Yeah, definitely. You know, to some extent with this. Um, so anyway, that I wanted to start with that. Like I don't consider myself to be a top tier developer. So anyway, 
there, I think, my again, there's probably a lot of people on this call who would consider you that. And I think that speaks to how subjective this is. It depends mm -hmm. on the measuring stick you're using. Yeah. Um, if your measuring stick is uh, knows everything there is possible to know about NetSuite, I'm nowhere near a top top tier NetSuite developer. I, yeah. I don't know everything about NetSuite, uh, and I will never know everything about NetSuite. And, um, but what? One of the things I do do well is learn. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very resourceful and I use all the resources I have, uh, which when you're a NetSuite developer is not very many. You don't get a lot of help. You don't get a lot of guidance. There's not, we don't have trail guides or whatever Salesforce has. You know, we don't have the, the courses and the uh, training modules and all that stuff. We just don't have that as NetSuite developers. We are often on our own or on very, very small teams. So you have yeah. to be very resourceful and efficient and effective using what little material and people that you do have to, to figure stuff out. And that means you need to be both resourceful and persistent because even if someone has solved your problem before, they probably haven't written about it or shared it or published it because mm -hmm. um, they're hoarding it as a trade secret. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but that's definitely one thing you really have to be, uh, you have to have, you have to be resourceful and resilient and, and persistent. And you need to just be continually learning, like build into your day, to your routine, whatever it is ways to learn to get up to speed on whatever the problem domain you're in happens to be. That's not unique to NetSuite. Uh, what's maybe unique to NetSuite is just the the narrow resources, you know, that we have available, educational content that we have available. Yeah. Yep. Well, I did start to come up with what I thought would be some some very, you know, specific things that I think make a good or great developer. And let's, so let's start with some of the, I think, some of the technical skills that I think make for a good developer. Because uh, I think, sure. you know, technical skills are obviously important, but I will also say they're probably not as important as you might think. Um, and we'll get to that part later, I guess. But uh, as far as like specific skills that I think are helpful, Sweet script, duh, right? Like, <laughs> um, you know, that's obviously a given if you're a NetSuite developer. But if you're new to NetSuite, I think, you know, JavaScript is probably your next best bet, right? That's really what Sweet script is, essentially. So there's that. And then I think similar technologies like Node.js. And then there's a technology that's out there now called Bun. I don't know if you've heard of that one or not. But it's a sort of a up-and-coming alternative, I guess, to Node. I think those are technologies that having experience with those will help you to be a good Suite Script developer. So there's the first one that I'll throw out. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, you are. If you are a NetSuite developer, you are by definition a JavaScript developer and need to uh, conduct yourself accordingly by learning JavaScript and all of the nuances and ins and outs therein, just like you would if you were a Go developer or a Java developer or whatever else. You are a JavaScript developer, like it or not, uh, which I love it. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of resistance to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but SweetScript is JavaScript. So you are a JavaScript developer. You should be learning JavaScript as much as you can about it and all the tools and whatever else that it, uh, that it affords you. Yeah. It's funny. You know, I used to really have a very negative opinion of JavaScript and that's changed dramatically over the past couple of years and even more so over the past year. So I'll talk about that at some point, maybe on another uh, podcast, like some of the work I'm doing that is just bizarre JavaScript stuff. I would call it, um, so anyway, sweet script, JavaScript, that's, I guess, the given. 
I think SQL, you know, we've talked about this in the past, how sweet QL is becoming, you know, increasingly important and increasingly popular. Um, when I first started messing around with sweet QL, I would see almost no mention of it anywhere, especially in job listings and stuff like that. And now, you know, if you look at some of the NetSuite developer um, opportunities on things like LinkedIn, um, you know, you actually can see some now where they're asking for SQL and sometimes it's sweet QL, sometimes it's both, um, you know, as one of the desired skills. So I think that's really interesting and, and good to see. So there's that. Yeah, that is a skill I've had to resurrect uh, in myself as well. You know, we, for a long time, we did not have access to write mm -hmm. SQL in, in NetSuite. So I, I definitely let that atrophy. I never enjoyed it in the first place, but uh, <laughs> I've had to, yeah, I've had to relearn and and improve my SQL muscles over the last few years now that we have SweetQL. Yeah. And yeah, by, by the nature of, I think that dovetails into like, by the nature of working on a third party platform, you know, you don't own NetSuite. Someone else is managing and changing and, and developing it actively. So you have to be ready to learn and adjust mm -hmm. and adapt uh, to this, this moving target um, or it's more like the moving fan, the ground under your feet is moving and you need to move with it uh, or yeah. you'll get left behind. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I had on my list was integration experience. I think that's a really, that's one of the nice to haves. And, um, you know, that can be everything from using, having experience with one of the um, the iPasses, the um, integration platform as a service, you know, Boomi and things like that. Um, I think even better is having some experience or building experience with some of the integration options that are, you know, native to NetSuite. So Restlets are always at the top of my list, but then I think having experience with Sweet Talk, you know, I just I guess as an aside, I what I'm seeing is that integration services are like just in high demand right now. They have been for a very long time, but I think even more so than ever, um, especially custom integrations. Um, to me, that's where the opportunities really are right now. The big good ones and it's where the big money is so if you've got an integration experience under your belt that's great if you don't try to get it so that's sort of a, a broad technical skill but what are your thoughts on that one are you seeing that too or i would say the the most common project i've had in my whole sweet script career is, is some something integrate like there's an integration somewhere in it all the time mm -hmm. and in terms of being a just general web developer, I guess, a developer who works with internet technologies, the closer you can get to understanding like REST and HTTPS and all the, you know, the bare metal stuff or as close to the bare metal as we get uh, is very important. And that would, that will serve you well in, in NetSuite integrations as well. The stuff like, um, you know, the third party stuff like the boomies and jitter bits or whatever the, I know, all the funny all names those things. different uh, <laughs> uh those those are still yeah. good and those might serve you well in certain domains but they're probably not going to be generally applicable i can count on one hand the amount of times i've touched those those third-party applications but that won't be true for everyone there are some people who are gonna you know either their company is going to use those and then yeah dive in or their clients you know they routinely recommend that product to their clients so yeah you want to know how to to support that and and understand it well yeah um which kind of branches into like the breadth of while being a net suite developer is very specific and very small community it's still a very wide topic there's a lot of ways to be a net suite developer and then you may never see some of the like uh you may never ever touch manufacturing you, you might just never see it you may never touch sweet commerce i haven't um, like there's NetSuite is yes, a very small and focused community, but it's a very broad platform that has a lot of functionality in it. That's only expanded by third-party tools and, and apps and things like that. So 
you can, uh, that's why we can't sit here and give you like the list, you know, the curriculum of things to learn or the skills to check off. We, we can't do it. It's, it's too broad, yeah. even though NetSuite is very specific and small. But you hit on something there that I wanted to talk about, which is, you know, it's easy to just sort of gloss over the fact that like NetSuite, you know, it's a, it's a web-based platform, right? So I think having that sort of fundamental understanding of web development is extremely helpful. It really um, is. You know, if you've never developed your own web app before, you know, you're missing out on like, I don't know, it's easy to, to take for granted some of the things that NetSuite does for us as developers, things like security and session manager management and maintaining state and things like that. Absolutely. So think, you know, understanding like how those work, it's, you know, it, it can be very helpful when you're trying, especially when you're trying to figure out like, you know, what's going on with this, you know, sweet lid or what have you, you know, it, just having that, that background knowledge can really help. And also, of course, if there's an integration project, it helps there too. So, mm -hmm. But I think I'll yeah, just, more... okay. If you go to write a restlet and you don't know what the difference between get and post is or put <laughs> and delete, like things like that, or the difference between the client side and the server side, you know, those are very fundamental concepts to any web development, not just NetSuite, mm -hmm. but they are very important distinctions here as well. Yeah. So I also think that, and this is in, along the lines of technical skills, but just like just having good, I think, general common sense development skills. And we've, you know, hinted at this in the past in other episodes, things like commenting your code, naming things clearly, um, writing modular code, but not going crazy, you know, with that consistency in your code, just, so, you know, again, like sort of common sense things that go into good code and and knowing what that is to you anyway i think that is a technical skill but you can't just put a name on it maybe it's writing clean code we've had you know episode in the past about that but yeah i um, think all the there's nothing unique about for, for from my perspective there's nothing unique about being a netsuite developer that you wouldn't want a java developer to to do or like there's the, all the things that apply to to most development apply to NetSuite development as well. Yeah. Yes, every platform and language has its nuances and stuff, but in general, as far as especially as far as technical skills and 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 habits, there there's nothing unique about being a NetSuite developer. You still want yes, make good documentation, uh, do good design, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, write maintainable code so you don't hate yourself in six months or the person who takes over after you doesn't hate you. Uh, again, be someone that a teammate can't wait to work with again. Um, yeah. All right. So I think we should get this next thing out of the way too, which I wrote down, which is because okay. I get asked this a lot and I think we've talked about it a lot, which is the importance or lack thereof, of certifications. And I would throw in there, you know, formal uh, computer science education. Um, you know, again, we've talked about this a lot in the past. I think we share the same opinion of this, that, you know, they're nice to have the certs, um, but not necessary. And for me personally, I'd much rather see a developer or a candidate, you know, um, that had real world experience over somebody who just has the certificates, right? And I realize that sometimes that's hard to get, um, but mm -hmm. real world experience, but I don't know what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. That's one of the questions we had was our opinions on certifications. So good job. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I, I want to be careful not to like insult or denigrate, but, the certifications, the NetSuite certifications, there's no guarantee that passing a NetSuite certification makes you a good developer. They don't, there's no way for them to test that. Uh, I don't have them. My my certs are not up to date. I have held them in the past uh, when it was required for a job, but I, the clients never ask for them and employers 
haven't asked for them. So I don't have them. I don't think the tests are representative of the skills and the problem solving necessary to be a NetSuite developer. And I think similar, though not to the same extent, perhaps about a formal, say, computer science degree. There's no guarantee that having that degree uh, makes you automatically makes you a good developer. I don't have a computer science degree. I have similar degrees, but um, I, I don't have one of those. I don't have a programming degree. Um, and I would say most people I've hired and work with don't either. Um, you don't, so they are definitely not prerequisites. There's nothing in them that, that, that not having those means you can't be a NetSuite developer. I would never say that. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just like the certs that they're having that formal education is nice to have, but it's not required. And from what I'm seeing, you know, in looking at uh, the jobs on LinkedIn, and by the way, when I say that, I'm not looking for a job on LinkedIn. I'm just looking to see what's going on. It's a good. I think it's a, it's good to do that, whether you're looking or not. Like, what what does the market yeah. like out there for NetSuite? Sometimes developers? you can't avoid the recruiters anyway. <laughs> well, that's they're too, going yeah. to find you. <laughs> um, but from what I'm seeing with the job the job listings these days, like you know, I can't remember the last time I saw one where a degree was re required. It was always sort of a nice to have. So I think it's becoming less important in yeah the NetSuite job market, and I also think in the job market in general, um, and I would even add that I would kind of be leery of a job that listed one where it was required, you know, like, especially a NetSuite job, but what is it about that NetSuite position where they, you know, need a master's degree in computer science or something? It's like, okay, yeah, <laughs> let's talk, because I'm curious. <laughs> um, I don't have a master's degree in computer science, mm -hmm. by the way, so I'm- I'd almost master. rather let's see- talk. Yeah, I'd almost rather see or hire a developer with an accounting degree mm -hmm. in, in NetSuite as opposed to a computer science degree because they'll have much more relevant education than, yeah. you know, I don't, I'm not trying to write, you know, groundbreaking performant algorithms day to day. I'm, I'm trying to automate some business processes. So like, the the technical depth of a lot of the problems we solve a lot not all it's not very deep it it's not super intense you know uh bleeding edge technical work it's not and it probably never will be um i can yeah. count on one finger the amount of times i've needed to use a, a binary tree in my in my sweet script code you know mm -hmm. we just don't write that level of, of academic algorithms we don't need to yeah so i'd rather see someone who knows what the gl is and who knows what debits and credits are versus someone who knows how to sort a, a black white tree or red black tree whatever they're called i don't remember <laughs> um yeah yeah, yeah I, I agree with you there yeah for sure so we've talked about technical skills. We've talked about certification and education. And, and so I think, you know, I alluded to this when I started with the technical skills. I said, obviously, they're important, but maybe not as important as you think. And so what are the opposite of that? For me, that's the soft skills. That's, you know, like, um, and I think that they are, when I say soft skills, we'll talk about in a minute what that means, like what those are. But I think that they're just as important, maybe even more important then the technical skills. Um, are, are you familiar with John? I'm going to totally butcher his last name, but I think it's Sanmez. Have you ever heard of him, Eric? Yep. Okay. So you, you're familiar with him. And for those of you who are on the mm -hmm. call who aren't, he's a software developer. He's an author. He's written a bunch of books about making a career of software development. He actually has a book called Soft Skills. Um, he has a really popular blog a YouTube channel. I mean, this guy's everywhere and he's pretty awesome. Um, and I found a quote from him that I wanted to share. It says, he said, technical skills alone aren't enough for a successful career or life. <laughs> and I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah. 
it would be great to interview him sometime too, by the way. So if anybody knows him or whatever, and yeah. <laughs> nudge him up. a little bit for us. Yeah. Um, but I think that sort of sets the stage for like what, like what I'm talking about when I say soft skills, it's everything else. It's what, it's one thing to work with someone or hire someone as an NetSuite developer and they're just brilliant, right? But if they don't have soft skills to go along with it, if they're not, you know, easy to work with, you know, we'll talk about some more of the soft skills. Um, I don't know. I think it's not going to be a good experience for you or for them, right? So, yeah. And I think that's that's part of where my definition of good for this conversation came from. But yeah. It's like if if you are unpleasant to work with or stubborn or uh, any of those things, so a client, a user, a teammate are not going to want to work with you again. And I think that's that's where my again, that's where my definition comes from. Be someone who yeah. the people around you want to work with again, can't wait to work with again. And if you are set in your ways or, uh, uh, any of the maybe soft skills we're, we're about to talk about, uh, they're not going to want to do that. They'll go somewhere else. Even if you do the best, the technically best work, the best code, the cleanest code, if you weren't pleasant to work with, that client's not going to hire you again. Yeah. It's like being a doctor. You could be like, maybe you're a really awesome doctor, but you don't have a good bedside manner or something, right? It's like, yeah, he healed me and fixed me up, but I'm not sure, you know, whether I'd really recommend the work again or not. I don't know. I maybe can't I wait say to that, see but... someone else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's that. So let's go through some of the specific soft, soft skills, um, if that's cool with you. And I'll, I've got a list. So do you want me to kick that off or? Sure. That sound good? All Why right. Not? So. The first one I came up with, because I thought about this a lot, was the ability to solve problems, right? So, you know, breaking a big problem down into smaller, manageable um, tasks. You, you talked about, you mentioned like design earlier, you know, as, as a, a really kind of as a technical skill, but I think it's a little bit of both, right? Yep. So there's... You know, yeah, that. you can't design something. You can't design a system, especially a say business process, without talking to people and working with people and understanding their needs. Yeah, and so I think design sits staunchly in the middle of the hard and soft. It's both. It's both hard yeah. and soft. Yep. It's, I think part of that is asking good questions too, right? Trying to get to what the goal of the project is or the problem that you're trying to solve and. You know, sometimes that's as much about listening as anything else, right? Like, so most of the that. time, it's about listening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's and that's one of the things I I had written down as well. I wasn't thinking in terms of like hard and soft skills when I was sort of thinking about this conversation, but you've got to be. I already mentioned you've got to be willing to learn. Of course, you have to be willing to learn the latest cool tech stuff, but also you have to be willing to learn the not so sexy business stuff, <laughs> like the less fun, you know, mm -hmm. user stuff, uh, the pain points and the processes and the, the, the domain of your users is also your domain. Yeah. So you have to be willing to stretch beyond just technical skills. You've got to be willing and able to talk to the users or the clients, you know, whoever you might be serving. Um, to really understand their needs, their pain points, their goals in the vocabulary that they use. Mm -hmm. You've really got to throw yourself into their domains as much as possible. That will make you, that will set you apart from almost any other developer, but other NetSuite developers as well. If you are able to sort of straddle, straddle that technical and personal or business line yeah, that's a good segue. And the, the next one I had was that, you know, that you understand Nailed business it. in general, right? Yeah. And so I've been saying this for a long time. Like if I was given the choice between working with or hiring someone that had, say, great technical skills, but just no business sense, you know, um, or experience and someone else who maybe does have a great sense of business, like you mentioned somebody that might have an like accounting experience or 
is a CPA or something like that, but maybe they have limited or almost no technical skills. I'd rather have the person with the business sense and experience like every time because you can teach technical skills. That doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be a great developer. But I think with what we're doing in NetSuite, having that understanding of business is critical. So like when I'm talking to a, a NetSuite developer and, you know, especially somebody that is experienced and they don't know the difference between accounts payable and accounts receivable or debits and credits, and they don't understand what GL impact is, you know, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> it makes me wonder what they've been doing in that suite, you know? Um, so again, like, yeah, I think it's, it's the technical skills there and then the ability to understand business. And like you were saying, communicate in terms that other business people are going to understand, especially accountants, and controllers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say on that, it, it is a problem, yes, if you don't have that knowledge. It's it's a deficit to your to your opportunities, to your skill set. You and but it's not a prerequisite. You don't need to right. come to NetSuite development being an accountant. I certainly wasn't. I had no business sense at all. I did not know what accounts payable and receivable were when I started being a NetSuite developer. But you have to be willing to learn. Mm -hmm. So if you hear debits and credits and you just stuff your ears and and don't want to hear it that will probably shorten your NetSuite career if you are willing and open to learning that stuff just as you would be the latest you know javascript um you know ecmascript release uh you'll you'll set yourself up for much more success there are and i'll have to somehow put these in the show notes um but there are resources out there um, that are like accounting primers for developers. I'll have to try to find some of those and, and again, put them in the notes. But yeah, again, like it's it's not so much that you need those before you become a NetSuite developer. It's certainly, I think, very, very helpful. But yeah, you've got to be willing to learn or otherwise, I don't know, you know you're going to have a short and difficult road <laughs> you won't enjoy yourself no you'll never yeah, enjoy you yourself a and, you, and you'll bounce off yeah. yeah there's just certain things i think that are kind of expected you know and when a business person whether it's an analyst or again you know the accountant or cfo what have you is talking to you and trying to communicate their needs to you they're going to use terms like that and they're gonna i think assume that you know those things so maybe fake it till you make it but learn <laughs> so there's that um ask be willing to look dumb and ask mm -hmm. it will serve you well in the long run yeah and you won't no. actually look dumb <laughs> no i think and, and you hinted around about this before too i think you've got to be willing to learn and i think you almost have to love learning to be good at this because there's constantly things to learn about whether it's you know, something with the business itself. Like I didn't know anything about manufacturing up until maybe two, two and a half years ago. And I'm not saying I'm an expert on it now, but it was, you know, an education, a quick one. And I loved it. You know, I loved learning about that side of business. I'd just never been exposed to it before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that that is really important. Um, yeah. I think maybe let's give ourselves like four more minutes here till 40 and then we'll let's get into some of these questions because we have a lot of them yeah all right um you want to skip around to like i think in the show description we talked about what makes a good netsuite developer you want to throw some ideas out there on what makes a better than good like an exceptional developer um yeah sure i think this sits, this is another thing that sits between technical and soft skills. It's it's very similar to design, but problem decomposition mm -hmm. uh, is an incredibly important skill. And if you are, say, a NetSuite developer who writes uh, the for submit event and all the code is linear and in the before submit function, you are not decomposing your problems. 
Uh, you are not breaking them down and understanding the individual pieces, and that code is going to be a nightmare to maintain. The longer it gets, the the older it gets, the more you try to add to it. So if you are never using the function keyword, if you are never using um, separate modules and things like that, and third-party libraries to, to solve already solved problems, if you're not doing those things, um, start learning, I guess. And uh, that's that's like the next step, I would say, to, to elevate your career. Learn how to break down these business requirements into um, sustainable software systems that can be easily uh, maintained, changed, updated uh, by someone else too. So if you're not decomposing problems and establishing patterns and consistency in your code base, that is the next level of, of engineering to add to your repertoire. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. That kind of goes with, you know, I was mentioning earlier about problem solving and it's more than just like sitting down and thinking about how am I going to do this? Like, what's the, what's the problem? The big problem that I need to solve, let's break it into smaller problems that should kind of be, I think, reflected in your code. And I think that's what you're getting at there. So yeah, smaller, if you, if you're just, if all your problems are solved with a monolith of code, you're going to have a terrible time troubleshooting and testing and yeah. adding and, and changing. Um, it's going to be a nightmare, but if you're breaking these requirements down into small uh, pieces, smaller pieces are easier to swap. They're easier to change. They're easier to test. They're easier to troubleshoot all of that stuff. So way too often I inherit, you know, a thousand line uh, field changed functions <laughs> and it's a nightmare. It's so hard to, to untangle um, and, and figure out just to figure out what's going on. So you mentioned those are, that the, when I inherit code like that, those are developers. I don't want to work with. Yeah, that's what I, I would never like say. to work with that developer. Yeah. <laughs> and and you might, if you're the person writing that code and you come back to it later, you might want to be the guy, or you might be the guy where you're like, I never want to work with this guy again. And you realize it's you, you know, <laughs> except you don't have a choice. So yeah. yeah. Uh, so we have. I mean, you you're a JavaScript developer. You have all the tools that JavaScript gives. Now you have classes. You have modules. You have mm -hmm. functions. You have all of those great software design tools. Um, you have tons of third-party libraries at your disposal. Uh, it's a very popular language. There's a lot of active development. You have all kinds of tools at your disposal. Use them, learn them, use them. Absolutely. So one of the things I took I all had... our time. I took all of our time on that one. That one. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, let me just wrap up then with one I last will, thought. So going from good to great, I think, especially, um, you know, whether you're new to NetSuite or not, I think it's the experience that you have and that you're going to get. So by that, I mean, like, if you have experience with other ERPs, other business systems, and you're coming into NetSuite, I think that is awesome. Uh, you know, it's really a good, you know, nice to have, I guess. I think if you're coming at NetSuite development from a previous NetSuite role, like maybe you're a business analyst, an admin, or like you're a project manager, you know, especially if you managed a NetSuite implementation project and you saw that developer work that went into it and you're like, yeah, oh, maybe I'd like to give that a shot. I think that's awesome. You know, that experience is invaluable. Um, you, you mentioned accounting right. experience. I think that's you know, awesome too. Um, and then I'll kind of like talk out both sides of my mouth here. I, was, I think having a specialization or having some domain knowledge is important. And we've talked about specialization in the past and previous episodes. But then also, here's the other side, you know, having sort of broad experience and where you've maybe helped businesses that are running on that suite and those businesses are, you know, maybe drastically different. You know, maybe... You know, one is a distributor, another is a manufacturer. I, I don't know. It, um, you know and, you know, in, in working with all those different types of businesses, I think you're going to be exposed to, you know, features and modules, you know, things like multi-currency, multi-subsidiary, um, revenue recognitions is still a big one. Um, mm -hmm. All that experience is just 
the more experience you can get like that, the better. But then if you do find a specialization, that's maybe worth pursuing too. And it's going to make you stand out, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can choose, but you don't have to. We've already talked about how broad NetSuite is. You can hop from, especially if you work at a, a consulting firm or something like that, you're going to get a very wide, uh, you know, experience and exposure to different features and business models and, and things like that. Um, but NetSuite itself is very broad. You have a lot of opportunity to go very broad and learn as much, you know, different business functions as possible. Or maybe you work in one very specific domain of NetSuite. That's okay too. They're both mm -hmm. okay. They're both good. They'll both serve you well. Um, early on, maybe go for breadth and and start to narrow down a focus. But I don't think either one is, neither is mandatory and neither is bad. You know, being very focused and specific. We talked to um, Tim last week about, or last month rather, about, you know, he does data imports for NetSuite implementations. That's extremely narrow, right? Uh, you can pick very narrow focuses within, within NetSuite even, um, or not. But both will serve you well, I think. Uh, okay. Yeah. Questions. Let's get to questions. We have a lot. I do <laughs> uh -huh. want to wrap up at the end with some things we did not say. So just a little, a little teaser there, I guess, but all right, let's see. Sutha has a question. What is your thoughts on using TypeScript? I'm just going in order of most upvotes. Uh, so thoughts on using TypeScript in terms of writing better code as opposed to using JavaScript. I have lots of thoughts. Tim, do you have any thoughts? I don't. I have not used TypeScript yet. Right. And yeah, so I'm curious to hear yours because I think you're a fan of it, aren't you? No. No. Okay, good. I don't use it. <laughs> uh, I don't I, I don't use it. The disclaimer, I don't use TypeScript. Using TypeScript does not guarantee or somehow magically automatically give you better code. That's not what happens. Uh, I don't like sort of class type oriented programming. So I, I don't do it. There's no attraction to TypeScript for me. Um, it just switching to TypeScript doesn't give you better code. It just gives you different tools uh, for writing code. So if you switch to TypeScript, but don't have good um, design principles, engineering fundamentals, you're still going to have bad code. Okay. Uh, okay. That said, if you love TypeScript, good, keep going, do it. I know lots of people <laughs> who use it successfully. Good for yeah. you. I, I'm not one of them. Uh, let's see. Adolfo, this is a, I read your post about Git flows. What is my preferred Git repository architecture for companies that aren't consultants? Um, okay. Tim, do you use Git yet? <laughs> I do not. What happened to you? You're blurred. I know. I'm, I'm trying. Yeah, that was... <laughs> um, okay. So. Yeah. Uh, classic consultant answer. It depends. Um in my personal like NetSuite projects and you know with my own clients, I never use a mono repo. I build SDF projects for specific um, features. Uh, so if they have some integration to an external system, that gets an SDF project. And if they have some other you know three-way matching approval, uh, that gets its own SDF project. Um, even if it's in the same NetSuite account, I split them out and each SDF project gets its own repo. I also have a full-time job. And in that job, we use a mono repo for all of our code. So uh, it depends on the resources you have, the skills you have, the knowledge you have. Um, both can be good, both can be bad. Um, so uh, it's a really hard question to answer, but uh, I think I talked about it. I have an SDF course uh, on Salto Leap that talks a little bit about the decision of mono repo versus yeah, separate repos. Um, and I have an article as well. 
Um, yeah, classically, I don't have a definitive answer for you. That's probably unsatisfying, but it really does depend. Uh, mono repos, I think, break down really quickly when you have very large code bases. If you're not doing something else with the SDF project to sort of manage, like, which objects is it looking at? Uh, if your SDF's not smart with objects, so if you put all your objects in one repo, your deployments are going to take forever, your validation is going to take forever, and um, you might have to build something to to make it smarter to only look at changed objects and, and things like that. And uh, it gets really challenging. So I guess my preference, though, is separate repos, small repos, small SDF projects, very focused, um, that sometimes have dependencies between each other. All right. Uh, I mentioned NetSuite resources and documentation are not the best, but is improving. What are my thoughts on new developers to NetSuite and the generative AI horizon? I think there's a ton of potential there. I think if you try to learn SweetScript now with, say, ChatGPT, it will be miserable. You will not uh, write successful SweetScript. Um, I've played around with like Copilot and ChatGPT a little bit to try and just to see what, what it can do. And right now, um, it's just not there. It's not helpful. It writes often wrong code. Learning what to do with that code once you have, like, there's way more than just writing the code to get it to run in NetSuite. And often that information is missing. Um, but that's right now. In the future, I, I have no plans of like stopping learning. Like, I'm going to keep learning because this is a whole new frontier. I think there's a ton of potential there and we should all be keeping abreast. But Right now, it's not a good way to to learn. It's maybe a good way to learn what not to do. Uh, Tim, I'll kick that one to you. Well, I was going to say we actually, you know, um, Eric and I have a big list of potential future episodes, and we've talked about doing an AI episode. And in my Absolutely. notes for the title, I have AI colon friend or foe. <laughs> <laughs> well, and is the, the answer? The, yeah, right. I think the implication or the like what I'm getting at there is that I. You know, there's still also this fear, I think, that AI is going to take our jobs. Um, I don't think we have to worry about being, uh, I'll totally regret saying this, right, in a year when I'm looking for work. Uh, no. I don't think we have anything to worry about right now. Um, so AI is not going to take your job. Developers using AI are going to take your job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, what would you consider to be best practices for managing code and deployments across multiple environments in NetSuite? Uh, I'm going to guess that Salto has a few things to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's Salto is an option. Definitely SDF. I use SDF for all of, of mine, and I'm learning Salto as well um, to, to try and compare and see, see what the difference is there. but I think the best practice for, for managing your code, just like any other development, uh, use source control. Tim, use source control. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I can talk about what I use, but yeah, I just, I am not a Git guy yet. Don't know uh, that I'll ever be, but yeah. we'll see. I have my I prefer own tooling. Git. Uh, yeah. I, I, so if you want like my um, code, my stack, if you will, for managing uh, my code. I use Git, uh, usually GitLab, sometimes GitHub. I use SDF for all of my uh, sort of NetSuite object management and validation and deployment, all of that good stuff. Um, yeah, SDF handles multiple environments very well. It's, it's very easy to generate tokens and, and switch between environments. I know Salto does the same. You can manage and move stuff between multiple environments. I avoid bundles like the plague. I avoid copy to account uh, and things like that. But SDF so far, for the most part, works great. There are definitely some edge cases where it does not work great, uh, like workflows and transaction forms and things like that that aren't fully supported. Um, so... Um, 
in my Git repo, I use uh, a branching scheme, basically uh, a master branch or a main branch and feature branches. Um, what else? What am I missing? <laughs> I think those are the things I do. I know that's a really quick rundown. I could make a whole episode probably about that uh, myself. Anything to add, Tim? <laughs> how do you how do you manage it since you're not using those things? I that would be, yeah, another episode. But yeah, I you know I've <laughs> okay. it, on my blog I have shared some of the tools that I've built to essentially do web development the way that I prefer to do it, but do it and apply it to the NetSuite world. So sure. I'll just leave it for now at that. I have there's a method to my madness, to me anyway. Right. No one else would understand it. But no, probably Tim's not. got it. That's why I work uh, by yeah, myself so for myself. I guess look forward to to more on that in a future episode. Mm, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. What is your opinion on using frameworks such as Angular, Vue, or React in NetSuite development? Tim. I have messed around with things like React in the past. Um, I have my own framework for building simple uh, web apps inside of NetSuite, and I've shared that on my blog before too. Um, that has evolved since I originally shared it. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm just glad to see that people are starting to apply, I guess, more um, you know popular web development techniques and frameworks and stuff like that to NetSuite work because there's not a lot of people that are talking about doing that. I think we're starting to see people share those techniques and experiences that they have. And I think it's just interesting because what, what we're seeing, I think, are applications that run inside of NetSuite that um, you know, we, we wouldn't have thought of a few years ago. Of, you know, things yeah. that we can do today that we're, you know, we weren't thinking of doing in the past. So I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Um I'm not for or against any framework. Um I think if, you know, if you're trying to say build a UI that you want a lot more features than the native, you know, suitelets give you, go for it. Go nuts with Vue or Angular or whatever you have. Mm -hmm. You and the team around you have the skill set to manage. Um, where I think uh, we get into trouble, uh, we can get into trouble using either third party stuff for frameworks or libraries, whatever is when we start to abstract too far, like we try to build abstractions over the sweet script API, where like you're writing your own query module. Yeah, that's, that's where I draw the line. I do not want to see that um, because that's going to be really hard for someone else to pick up. It's mm -hmm. going to be hard for you to on, it makes it harder for you to onboard new teammates. It makes it harder for you to pass that code off. Um, when you start to like abstract and write your own ways to work with records or ways to write searches or ways to run queries that that's where i think uh i would say don't do that <laughs> yeah, i think your code um, becomes sort of brittle at that point and you are likely it to it's going to break at some point in the future and then you're going to be like uh, i don't quite remember what i did here so yeah even if you really don't like the sweet script api i'm sorry like you, <laughs> you work you work in a, a third party service platform, you know, yeah. um, the it more grows you, on you, the more, yeah, it, it does. And you do find, you can still find patterns and ways and designs to make it more palatable. If you, if you really don't like it without completely rewriting or abstracting those modules, it just makes it really hard. That code becomes a lot more brittle, a lot less not necessarily brittle, but less maintainable for sure. And less, it, it just makes it harder. Now you have, if you hire, even if you hire a sweet script developer, you have to teach them a whole new API to, 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 to manage your app. Um, and so nothing against any frameworks, Angular, Vue for, for the, for the purposes they are built for. Awesome. Go for it, use it. But as soon as you start abstracting the sweet script API, I, I get a little, I bristle. <laughs> Uh, how much time we got? A few minutes left. Uh, we might stick around a little bit longer today. We, we want to. I don't know, Tim. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, it looks like we've got a lot of questions. So yeah, still have a lot of 
A lot of questions. I do see one. I'm going to jump ahead real quick. Yes, the recording will be available on Salta's YouTube channel and at some point in the Sweet Script Stories podcast feed. Um, okay. I so like how you place... said that. <laughs> we have kind hey. of an inside joke. I keep telling Eric that I'm going to update our website and I, how long has that been going on? I'm, you've, you're making me chew my lip. I'm stressing <laughs> yeah, out about it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. And and the recording will also be available on uh, Salto Leap at, uh, in the webinars section. All for free, of course. Uh, yeah, so we'll probably stick around, try to get through as many of these as we can, maybe spend a few extra minutes. Uh, so here we go. How about unit testing and frameworks like Jest? Do you consider them as important? Yes. <laughs> Emphatically, yes, I do. Tim, I don't know about you. I'm not going to comment. I think they <laughs> are critical. The larger your code base gets and the larger your team gets, uh, unit testing, any sort of automated testing becomes critical. I, in our, like the current code base I'm working on with, with my team, we've about four of us working on uh hundreds of thousands if not millions of lines of sweet script i i don't know what our line count is right now it's a lot a lot of it has been you know around for years uh and i cannot tell you i cannot explain what a relief it is to work in the areas of the code where we have unit tests and other automated testing because i know i have so much more confidence when I change something that I didn't break something else that I, that I didn't think about or, or that I didn't even know was there. And so we're going through a huge uh, investment right now, adding unit testing on every single pull request. We, we require unit tests because we're trying to increase the code coverage and our confidence in our code base and our changes. We're trying to add automated sort of integration end to end testing so that when we, uh, before we kick off a deployment, we are running end-to-end -end tests automatically. Um, and all of that serves to increase our confidence in our code base and the changes we're making and that our deployment is not going to explode in our face. Um, and so, yes, please learn, use uh, unit testing, integration testing, end-to-end -end testing, whatever level of testing you can use. I, I recommend learning it and using it. Another very useful skill to learn. That is a discipline all its own, automated testing. All right. I saw a question down here about resources for people. I, I can't quite find it. I've lost the question, but for people looking to get into NetSuite development or what have you, I always recommend, Eric, your cookbooks. I'm not sure what the status of those are as far as availability goes. Um, but your cookbooks were awesome for me uh, when I started out, even after I started out. And then there's um, a book by Matt Dossi, the NetSuite Development with SuiteScript 2.0, mm -hmm. which we can put a link to somewhere, put them in the show notes if I ever post them. Um, that's an awesome book as well. So not, again, yeah. I'm not sure who asked that, but I saw it and I'm trying to scroll up and down for it. Right. There's one specifically about resources for NetSuite integrations, but those those will Matt's book certainly will help you on that. Mm -hmm. I know he goes over, I think, all the script types in that book. Yeah. Uh, Restlets included. So mm -hmm. um, that's one of the best, maybe one of the only, you know, how to sweet script books out there. Um, and can't recommend that enough. I don't know. Do you have any? Yeah, there's a question here. What is the best source of learning NetSuite integration? Any any uh, resources, Tim, on integration uh, specifically? Well, again, I think Matt's book is awesome as far as that type of resource goes. There are um, courses available through the Learning Pass that do go into Sweet Talk. Um, I think there's one that covers Restlets, uh, but you've got you know some official you know somewhat expensive, I guess, options there. Sure. Um, I think yeah. there's a lot of, you know, I try to blog about things like Sweet Talk a lot. And I know there's other blog posts out there on those things. So, and then of course, um, the uh, the Slack community, NetSuite Professional Slack, there are channels for 
there's one for integration, there's one specifically for sweet talk. Um, so, you know, if you've got a question, I think those are good places to go. I'm not sure that it's going to be easy to learn there other than, you know, when you hit a problem, that's a good place to go and ask about it. So, Yeah, I think that, and I probably wish I would have said this earlier, but like, that's where the you're as a NetSuite developer or as really as a person, you're only as good as the people around you. And so if you are a solo NetSuite developer, yeah, you can use, you know, the help docs or find YouTube videos, maybe, or read Matt's book. Um, but uh, you're only going to be as good as like the people, the community you build around you. The, so the people looking at your code, you know, if no one else is looking at your code, how do you know? You know, how do you know what... Uh, what could be improved? How can you, you're going to learn a lot less if you don't have a team around you. Um, and not everyone has, it's not like a choice. Not everyone has a team around them. Uh, but if, so if you don't have a team around you, uh, make some friends who are NetSuite developers. If you don't have friends who are NetSuite developers, join the NetSuite professional Slack community and just, just follow along, follow along the, you know, NetSuite and SuiteScript tags on Stack Overflow, that sort of thing. Um, that gives you so many more opportunities to learn by surrounding yourself with other people who are doing, who are on this NetSuite developer journey as well. I also think that looking at other developers' code is very helpful. So again, like if you're on a team, I think you're yeah. more likely to have access to that. But even if you're not, if, you've, if you're coming into a NetSuite um, account that's been around for a while, there's almost always customizations that have been made in the past. And so looking at, you know, scripts that are in the file cabinet, for example, you know, like, what is this? Like, you know, but, I don't know it's, a, it's helpful. Sometimes it's helpful in a weird way in that you look at it and you're like, okay, that's not, I'm not going to write code that looks like that. So anyway, that's another option though, is to look at other people's code. Yeah that um i think we'll spend maybe just a few more minutes going through some of these questions but that dovetails nicely into matt's question here do you have any insight into the additional modules i'm guessing that's just third party modules um with netsuite development's narrow guidance it can be difficult to find healthy and up-to-date information on how to add modules um, and other best practices like the field update spaghetti <laughs> Uh, I know exactly what you mean by field update spaghetti, and I have, I know how I handle that. Um, but uh, Tim, do you use many like third party modules or libraries or? Yeah, I mean, I'm using. That for you. Yeah, I mean, judiciously, I guess, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not going crazy bringing other you know, libraries and external libraries in, um, as far as the modules go. Yeah. I mean, to some extent I'm doing that, you know, I, I had a, when I was talking earlier about the work that I'm doing is primarily integration work at this point is part of why I joked around about not being such a great sweet script developer, right? Um, most of my work is outside of the NetSuite box. So, you know, I'm doing work like building web apps that live outside of NetSuite, mobile apps, desktop apps. That's, for me, integration is where it, it, the action is these days. That being said, I, you know, I'm still doing some pure sweet script work, um, but it's not to the extent that it was even a year mm -hmm. ago. So, yeah. Uh, for me, uh, yeah, there are lots of third-party modules I use. I use like Lodash a lot. I use Moment a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, even despite the fact that it's you know end of life, um, it still works great for NetSuite yeah. and the purposes I need it for. Um, uh, Papa parse for CSV mm -hmm. and JSON parsing, things like that. Uh, so yeah, there are third-party modules that are you know, huge modules in the larger JavaScript community that work just fine in NetSuite as well. All you need is for them to either be distributed or shimmable into a the the AMD, you know, module format that the NetSuite uses. So um, 
it's hard to like explain that, like show that or something without showing code here. But um, I think we have. I uh, so that's... far have not had any trouble getting getting a third party library to work in NetSuite. Where you might really run into problems is is if you're trying to use something that that expects it to be on the client side, for instance, and has references to the document or or whatever, uh, and you're trying to use it in a user event script. I have seen that problem a lot. That's harder to shim. We actually have in our list of potential episodes um, modules as one of the topics. Yeah, third, to third party stuff. stuff. So yeah, we'll yeah, get there. Matt, we'll cover that. All right. I think I'm going to draw the line there and, and respect everyone's calendars and uh, or at least disrespect them less than I, than I have now <laughs> um, and, uh, and bring us to a close. But I do want to touch really quick on things we did not say make good NetSuite developers. We did not say works the most hours. We did not say writes the most lines of code the fastest. And we did not say knows everything about NetSuite or JavaScript or anything. We didn't say any of those things. Those should not be the goals. Um, I think especially working the most hours is a trap a lot of us fall into, especially if you work for yourself, Tim, or or a consultancy who bills you by the hour. Mm -hmm. um, it's really easy to fall into that trap of, of working as many hours as possible. Well, what, what is going to make you a standout NetSuite developer is a long NetSuite career. And you can't do that if you are burned out. You shouldn't do that if you are burned out by always burning the midnight oil, as it were. Um, and often writing the most lines of code is a bad thing, not a good thing. We want to write the fewest lines of code to solve our problems effectively. Just to add to that real quick, one of the things I had that we didn't talk about in my notes was um, the ability to juggle multiple projects or tasks at the same time. I think that uh, some employers will say that's important. I would say maybe it's not or it shouldn't be, right? Like I'm I'm saying that as someone who's trying to go from working on multiple projects and I won't define multiple because it'll make me cry to one project at a time. That's been a mm -hmm. work in progress, I'd love to say. And I figured it out. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, it probably is a skill that you're going to have to pick up, but I would try to put it right back down. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think no matter what you're doing, you're always going to have distractions and interruptions that you that you need to manage, and and you'll have multiple priorities that need juggling. Um, but I think like I'm pretty sure I have I wrote a blog series about like red flags and job postings, and I'm almost positive that like multitasking was was mm -hmm. one of the red flags, um, for sure. So yeah, it can it can be very unhealthy to to have too many. You can have too many priorities, and that can yeah. be very unhealthy. Yeah. And uh, your employer hopefully is not forcing too many on you at once. But um, yeah, you need the tools and the processes so you can effectively manage multiple projects at once. But it shouldn't be twelve. You know, one, two, three, maybe. Yeah. Um, Anything yeah. else? Uh, no. Anything you want to add? Oh, somebody was asking about Matt's last name. It's Dossie. It's D A H S E, I think. Correct. Yeah. So, and yeah, we'll try to get his book is on there. his book is on uh, Lean Pub. That's it. It's probably the only sweet script book on Lean Pub. <laughs> yeah, it's been out for a while. I think it may have had an update, but yeah, you'll find it if you search for mm -hmm. it still relevant i would say i, I haven't is. read it in a while but i would would guess it's still a good foundation of, of sweet script 2.0 yep um okay so i think that will bring this episode of sweet script stories to a close thanks everybody who joined us live and especially those of you asking and voting on questions um i think that was a great conversation thank you for guiding it um the episode will be available on salto's youtube channel and on salto leap 
and sometime in the Sweet Script Stories podcast feed. So, uh, yeah. Soon, right. uh, soon trademarked by Tim. Uh, if <laughs> you would like to get in touch with us about the show, you can email me, eric at stoic.software, and you can check out Tim's website, timdietrich.me. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Salto and their DevOps platform, you can check out salto.io. And we hope you join us next time as we continue to explore and highlight interesting conversations and stories in the SweetScript world. And we'll see you then. Thanks.